Hello. Uh, is everyone in, Amanda? Yep, it doesn't look like the waiting room's enabled anymore, so we should be good to go. Perfect. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone today. Uh, the voice you hear is uh, me, uh, Dr. Stacey Kusel, I'm the curator of UBC Okanagan Gallery, and I had the pleasure of working with Sheldon Lewis on this commission. Um, I'd like to introduce a couple of people who would like to say a few words before Sheldon Lewis's talk. Sheldon Lewis will give an artist talk today, and then we will have a Q&A session where you can ask questions and, and get to know the artist and his work a little bit better. Um, but first I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Bill Cohen. He's a assistant professor. Um, he's from the Okanagan Nation with extensive, extensive kinship ties throughout BC and Washington. He specializes in areas of indigenous knowledge, research, education, and transforming ped pedagogy. For over 25 years, he's engaged in community-driven transforming, transforming projects as parent, volunteer, advisor, facilitator, and director. He's an educator, artist, storyteller, and author. The focus of Dr. Cohen's continuing research is to identify, understand, and theorize the transforming potential of Indigenous and Okanagan knowledge and pedagogy through organic language and cultural knowledge revitalization. As an educator, he has organized numerous community, school, arts, language, literacy, and numeracy projects involving elders, fluent speakers, parents, and children. Uh, Dr. Bill Cohen, if you'd like to say a few words. Lum Lum Stacy, gonna have to shorten that. White piece noxila, white piece lach lacht, wipe chiap, a ha uku silach, sukunakinuch, itum hulachtit, lutpen keen to huichmentum, kim to tumistmentum. Kiskiam and chutmentum, tachka keen me chachachum e kasa inchachen wichuntit. So just to greet everyone, we're we're all arriving, arriving here together, not quite in the same space, but uh, we're, we're here. And many of us, I think probably, probably all of us are in the unceded homeland territory of the, of the Silich, the Sukunakinu. And we're, we seek together a new relationship, one based in honor and respect. And we're, we're, we're gathered here to unveil a painting by artist Sheldon Lewis. So it was a Silich Sukunakinu artist. And uh, I'll just say a few a uh, few words about his art as he uses colors and evocative imagery that uh, really are about telling a story. And this uh, storytelling is very much connected to our Chaptuk, our history, our our our, Smi Mai, our our people person, our people histories. And uh, this uh, this painting, Chach uh, Alks, the red dress, is is a. Uh, I'll, I'll put it this way: I, I I know I know this I know who this is. I've, I've seen her. She's female. She's a woman. She's a stamia. She's a she's a mother. She's a tum, a skoi, stamtima, kakana, and she's seen her on the courthouse steps at. At, at protests, I've seen her in red dress campaigns, I've seen her in marches. She's, she's also a grandmother, a great grandmother, great, 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 great grandmother. She was there and taking care of kids when kids had no parents and adopting them. So this is a, this is a strong, really strong mother, grandmother, who it's really good to have her with us. So I'm going to uh, introduce our uh, Dr. Dr. Margaret McIntyre Latta. She's the director and, and also a professor in the Okanagan School of Education. And I can say, say uh, very much appreciation of, of, of Margaret as an ally, as a mentor. She's a mother and grandmother, and she really positions herself and, and her leadership to change the way things are and the way they have been in schooling and educational contexts. And she really, really does look to do that collaboratively through partnerships that are based in honor and respect. So, so Margaret. Wonderful, very, very generous introduction. Thank you, Bill. 
Um, and thank you to everybody for joining us this evening. As director of the Okanagan School of Education, I very much see the commissioning and installation of Sheldon Pierre Lewis's painting as marking an a an really important evolution within the Okanagan School of Education and the campus as a whole. And undoubtedly, it's a really important moment to reflect on the seriousness of what has happened in the name of education. The news that this country received of 215 indigenous children's remains found in the earth at the site of the Kamloops Indian Residential School has been overwhelming, confusing, and enraging for so many across our indigenous communities, our campus communities, our entire country and beyond. And I want to recognize that some of us may feel very challenged in this pandemic to absorb, to carry the weight of what we may be feeling. My deepest hope is that this institution, the school and the community can collectively find paths into healing. It's particularly important for the Okanagan School of Education community to recognize the significances of indigenous histories, cultures, knowledges and identities reflected in the learning environment. As the school is situated on the unceded territory of Silk's Okanagan Nation, the installation of Silk's artist Sheldon Pierre Lewis's painting significantly offers a cultural, visual, artistic, educative expression. The painting marks an important opportunity for the school for the campus and for the greater community seeking together a new relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples and the land, one very much based in honour and respect. Artworks are powerful, powerful mediums for expression and communication, and I'm really confident Sheldon's painting will be such an educative catalyst prompting ongoing teachings through conversations with prospective and practicing educators and the greater university community for generations to come. So thank you to Sheldon and I'll pass it on back to Stacy. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, we'll get to Sheldon uh, very soon here. I'd just like to say a few words about the UBC Okanagan Art Gallery and the public art collection. Um, I, I want to echo Margaret in that this is a time of, of great changes and greater understandings and, and um, we, we could even see it in the public art collection. Uh, the public art collection as of right now is only 5% Indigenous art. So in our last acquisitions committee meeting, uh, and Margaret's also on a committee member on the board, um, we changed the acquisitions policy to prioritize commissions from Indigenous artists. Uh, so that we can we could have more chances to work with and to commission uh, local Indigenous artists and Indigenous artists to help build a collection that represents the, the community, uh, the Okanagan and, and Can Canadian art uh, in a more sort of uh, a more sort of um, appropriate way, let's put it that way. Um, and a few words about uh, Sheldon Lewis. Uh, Sheldon Lewis is an artist that that brings people together. And I think that's one of the, the most exciting things about uh, his art. Uh, obviously, he's, he's, he's very skilled as a, as a painter, as an artist, as a muralist, um, but also he is a, a community leader. He's, he's well known and well liked by the local community. Um, his voice is one that's, that's very much respected and needed. And uh, it's it's been a it's been a thrill to work with him. I, I forget if I, I met him at the Indigenous Art Intensive uh, organized by Tanya Willard, or when I was at the Kelowna Art Gallery. But he's he's always been a person that's an active part of the contemporary art scene in the Okanagan, and also I, I probably part of uh, education and uh, future generations as well. So uh, it's with great. Uh, Great respect and honor that uh, I'd like to welcome Sheldon Lewis here uh, tonight to give a talk about his uh, most recent commission and about his artistic practice. Um, we're going to 
uh, take a break at 7.50 to uh, open the floor to questions and answers. If anyone has uh, questions or comments or uh, would like to have a chance to chat with Sheldon. Um, but, uh, but besides that, uh, thank you all for, for being here today. And thank you, Sheldon, very much for coming here and doing this. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that uh, intro, Stacy, And uh, you know, thank you, Bill, for your, for your kind words. Uh, and Margaret as well. Uh, each each one of you who have um, did the introduction, we've all had, uh, you know, a relationship uh, one way or another through uh, through the work that I do, either as a, a leader or as an artist. And you know, to keep coming back and engaging and re-engaging and and doing more work. Um, with all of you through these different uh, roles and different institutions is it's an honor you know you guys are creating space for us when in the past there really wasn't much space for us so I, I gotta lift my hands up to all of you for the work that you do in your respective roles and in the community for using your platform to create more opportunities for us uh Seawalk Nation members. So thank you. Thank all three of you. Um, White Peace Noxil, Kinchai Squeeze, Sheldon Lewis, Kintel Sinklahuten. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Sheldon Lewis. Uh, I come from um, the Okanagan Indian Band on the north end of uh, Okanagan Lake. Uh, I, I've been born and raised in the, the Six Mile Creek area where, where my family is situated. Um, you know, my entire life has been engulfed in art from a, uh, from a little child, you know, as, as, as old as I was, young as I was, being able to pick up a, a pencil or a crayon, it was something I've done my entire life. I was uh, blessed to have a, a father who was an artist and who had always nurtured and, and supported and taught me, you know, everything that he could. Um, through his different artistic practices. He was a, a multimedia artist and he himself was, was well known in, in community um, as, as well as Barb Marchand, you know, another relative and, and uh, a mentor of mine. She, she was very important, uh, very important person. And, and as, as well as um, um, my auntie, Twee Lucy Lewis, um, those three family members were instrumental in, in me being here today, you know, and I, I have to always acknowledge that every time I, I'm acknowledged for the work that I do and for my skills. Um, although it is a gift that, that I carry and I was given um, a lot of what they've done in, in helping me and supporting me and inspiring me is, um, it's a big part of, of my journey. So, you know, at the, the age of six, these three individuals, as well as a number of other uh, Okanagan Indian Band community members did a community art, uh, I guess an art show exhibit within community. And at six years old, I went home and I told my father, that's what I'm gonna do with my life. Um, I mean, most parents probably don't believe their six-year-old child, <laughs> your career, decisions probably change a hundred times between uh, six years old and, and being an adult but to be honest mine never has it's always been this and so knowing that and having that strong sense that this is what I was meant to do um, you know I'm grateful to be here and I've had um, in the past Eric Mitchell um, and Chris Marchand who coincidentally also have done a lot of in, important work for UBC um, sat my myself and my partner down who her herself is a multimedia artist and they explained to us that as artists we carry a, a very big responsibility within our communities and within our nations and they said that you know the gift that we have of being able to um, envision things and see things through the lenses that we do there's only so many of us that are given that gift and, and we have to we have to respect that and, and use it in a good way and so I, I've carried that, you know, over the last few years and been really mindful that I have to use my gift and my platform to create space for others to, to document, to, to teach, to educate, to, to fight. 
you know, a lot of times I go into uh, school settings and, and, you know, prior to COVID, I was doing a lot of youth mentoring through the arts. And I always share with those, those young minds that as artists, they have the ability to really enact change in the world. You know, um, a lot of times society overlooks um, the artist's um, contribution to the world. And, and, you know, I was lucky enough that I had, you know, family to, to nurture that in me. But a lot of times our, our young ones, especially our Indigenous youth, they, they, they lack those types of mentors and, and um, leaders that can help them understand that and guide them. And so, you know, in, in understanding my role as an artist and, and treating it as such, you know, I, I've really taken on a responsibility of trying to help and support and nurture our, our young ones. And I always use my art as an opportunity for education, you know, and this piece is, is no different than any other piece that I have. Um, this one's a little more, not as subtle as some. Um, in coming into be, becoming a professional artist, uh, I mean, I've been an artist my entire life, but I've pursued it professionally probably the last seven years. Um, I spent uh, 20 some odd years in addictions and alcoholism from the age of 14 to the age of uh, 31, I believe. And it was in coming out and becoming sober and, and traveling down that road that I really decided to respect my gift, give it the attention that it needed and, and nurture it in the way that I, I needed to. And, since then, there's been so many good things that have been placed in, in front of me, so many amazing opportunities that, you know, again, allow me to take my gift and, and um, share it with, with everybody out there and, and help teach and educate. And so, you know, these last seven years, I, I spent the first little bit being a bit uh, reserved, I guess, and then maybe a little careful with the type of imagery and messaging that I was putting into my art. I, I, I didn't want to come out and be completely in people's faces with my political messaging and my environmental um, advocating. Um, I wanted to, I guess, create a presence first, you know, and, and I played it safe and, and did a lot of um, um, work that, as Bill had uh, spoke of, you know, attached to our chaptique, attached to our culture, you know, and you can see the imagery behind us, which coincidentally, uh, one of Bill's daughters and a, a few of our other youth helped uh, me paint. And, you know, as time went on, I, I started being more comfortable with stepping out there and, and using my, my work as a, a political um, kind of advocation tool, you know, a bit of a weapon. And, um, you know, this, this canvas, when, when Stacy first approached me, um, you know, I was like, I was torn. I was like, do I do the, the nice, beautiful imagery of, of, of our culture, you know, and, and the traditions, you know, and essentially I, I was going to, um, but there was part of me that was like, no, this is an opportunity for you to use the, your platform to create space for this dialogue around the uh, murder and missing women and, and um, two-spirited people. Um, you know, uh, an epidemic, a uh, 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 crisis, you know, uh, a genocide that our people face on a daily basis. In the past, I, I had um, actually submitted to UBC uh, maybe five or so years ago um, to do a project and, and at that time I wanted to do a murdering missing women um, imagery but uh, at that time it wasn't chosen and so it came back and my gut told me you know this is this is something you need to do and so I I asked Stacy I said you know what would be the um, what would be the feeling around using this opportunity to to put this type of imagery out and you know she without a hesitation, you know, she said, you know, you have my full support. This is an important issue. And by all means, you, you do what you feel. And so I moved forward with this imagery. And, you know, in, in 
looking um, looking for ideas, I guess, as to how to portray this image and how to get this message out. I because of the times we're in, you know, dealing with COVID and the, the entire world. Um, moving through this this very new space that we're in i i really wanted to create a space that spoke to the time that we were in you know time that we as indigenous people are in you know the media over the last few years has been widespread um creating imagery to um paint a picture of of the 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 uh Indigenous people of Canada as being radical, um, you know, a lot of this fighting of the, the Trans Mountain and, and the, the water protectors and, you know, growing up, those were, those were things I gravitated towards. You know, I had um, family members, you know, in the 70s that were, were part of the American Indian movement, you know, and family who had, had helped and, and um, done work alongside them. And so, there was always uh, that resistance, I guess, spirit and um, energy in me. And so I hadn't really created imagery in that kind of space since I was a, a young man, teenager, I think. I had kind of put that, um, put those sorts of images away, so to speak, as, as I grew and matured and, and came to um, become sober, you know, the anger that uh, I carried as a young man dissipated somewhat. And so I, I put some of those things away, but the, the time that we were in, I felt, you know, we have to bring this back, you know, we have to bring this forward in a good way, you know, utilize this, this opportunity and, and, you know, call some of that energy back. And so, you know, with a, you know, a nationwide image of, of Indigenous people being radical. I really wanted to highlight that there's reasons behind that. There's, there's very deep-rooted generational um, roots as to why we take the stances we take and why we fight for the things we fight for. And, and I really wanted it to be an education piece. You know, I want people to ask, well, what is this about? What are you trying to say with this? You know, and, and the time that we're in, um, you know, we, we have been fighting and, and arguing with the, uh, the federal government to enact uh, a lot of these different documents that our people have, have informed, you know, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action, the, the final report uh, of the National Inquiry into Murdered and Missing and Indigenous Women and Girls, you know, a, a lot of these different things that we have poured generations of energy into in, in the spirit of, of fighting for some of the basic human rights that, that we feel um, we aren't um receiving from canada you know i i wanted to highlight that and i wanted to start that conversation and a lot of times i i, I use the analogy that i i can go, i could go out in front of ubco on the campus get a soapbox put my fist in the air and scream and rant and rave and then let all that anger come out people are going to walk by dismissive give me dirty looks you know, what, what's that crazy Indian doing, you know, but if I create a piece of artwork and it hangs there in that institution and people walk by it enough, sooner or later, they're going to stop and, you know, maybe ask the person beside them or reach out and be like, what is this? What's this about? And at that moment, those people who may have been dismissive and may have been closed off to hearing those conversations, they're now engaging that conversation they're initiating it from their their point of view or from there where they're at in their life and it's it's a safer space now rather than me ranting and raving it closes down your your senses you know it triggers those sorts of things and and so you don't feel safe and, and you don't want to engage but when you create a piece of artwork and and a person can engage at, at a point when they're ready at a point when they feel safe that conversation is, is much easier 
people can be much more receptive. And the intent there then is to carry forward, I guess, those discussions, educate people, let them carry that home to their homes, share what they learned that day, carry it into their classrooms, share that. And at the end of the day, we, we, we want to create awareness, you know, in, in light of the 215 at Kamloops and, and the other, um, I believe, uh, almost 300 so far, you know, 500 and something in total across Canada, you know, we're starting to see a shift in the, the, the spaces now. People are ready to start having some uncomfortable conversations, facing some of the, the, the dark present. You know, we hear quite often, oh, it's a dark, you know, it's a dark part of Canada's history. Well, it's, it's the present, you know. For those who don't know, you, you know, you don't know what you don't know, uh, you know. And we know, though, in community of, of all these different things that we face and so when I created this imagery, um, you know, the mask obviously represents the time we're in COVID. I really wanted to highlight that because, you know, I don't want to take away from any individual's own personal experiences, what, what they're going through during this time in COVID. I know we're all experiencing a, a different world for the first time, but we've seen and heard a lot of people speak that, you know, this um, notion that wearing a mask and having to be um, isolated and whatnot is, you know, it, it's an infringement on our rights. It's, it's oppression. And I think most of us in the Indigenous community, we kind of, you know, not, not to make light of the situation, but we kind of sit back and um, give our heads a shake a little bit, I think, because we're like, well, now you know what it feels like to be scalable. You know what it feels to be like Indian for a moment. We've been oppressed for, uh, you know, since contact. And so the intent there was to kind of open that conversation. I was like, well, you feel oppressed? That's what oppression feels like to you? Let us tell you what oppression really feels like. You know, and so then we get into, again, the, the red dress um, you know, we, we know that the, the red dress campaign is, is, is widespread across Canada, you know, and it, it, it sparked a lot of awareness. Um, but again, unfortunately, we're not seeing the outcomes that, that we would hope to from the, uh, the federal government, the provincial government, the uh, justice system, you know. And, and so again, uh, having a very strong Indigenous woman, you know, fist in the air, very powerful image of, of resistance and you know sometimes I I don't like the word resilience but you know because we shouldn't have to think of ourselves as being resilient we honestly shouldn't have to be because we should just be able to be but unfortunately because of society and because of the um, oppressive nature of the, the Canadian systems we have to be and we become resilient. And, and I wanted to, to, to capture that in a way that um, showed it more of, rather than being, um, you know, weakened. I wanted to show it as a, a, a stance of strength and power and, and showing, you know, that even though our women are going through this, you know, they are still standing there strong, you know, they're still fighting, you know, and, and, they fight every day of their lives, you know, as, as indigenous people, we always fight every day of our lives, but our indigenous women, um, they face it on a much different level than, than I think us as indigenous men do, you know, and so much toxic max masculinity and, and whatnot out there in the world and in, in the different systems they have to enter, the workplaces, the institutions, and I just really wanted to, to capture that strength of, of our women, you know, and, and again, you know, just show that, look, we're, we're still here. We're not going anywhere, you know, and I shared in the, the recent Indigenous News um, article with uh, Athena Bono um, that in the painting, if you'll look closely on the temples of the lady, there's... Um, 
some red ochre marks, some tulaman. Uh, my partner, uh, Chisekwa, she had um, requested, she said, you know, I, I would really like you to put these marks on, on her. And I said, yeah, no, by all means, you know, and, and for us, when we're going into different spaces, um, we use those marks uh, as protection, um, spiritual protection. And so, you know, wanting to show that as this woman is doing this, you know, important work and, and standing on that front line that, you know, she is protected and, and she is mindful of her own own um, self and her own need to protect herself when she's out there doing that work, you know, and, and so yeah it was it was a tough um process to go through you know but at the end of the day you know i felt that coming in and creating this imagery for ubc um you know i think that because it's a space that cultivates um and nurtures um, young leaders that are going to go out there into the world. These are the spaces that we still have to have these conversations. Um, you know, I, I, I certainly hope that these conversations are going on at homes and around dinner tables. Um, but at the very least, we need to at least initiate them here. So that way that hopefully we can connect in some way. Um, with these young minds and, and educate them that, you know, this is what we go through. This is what our women go through. You know, as you go out into the world, you know, we hope that you can use your platforms, you know, use your um, privileges to spread, I guess, our, our uh, story, our journey, you know, there's a lot of spaces that our people can't make it into or aren't allowed into. And so because of that, our voice, our messaging is, is always, it, it only reaches so far. You know, I think this recent issue with the uh, to come loops and the 215, we've seen a, a lot of allyship, you know, in these last few weeks. I think, you know, in my lifetime, I... I it's more allyship than I've ever seen, you know? And I think that's, for me, that is part of the intent is to create allies because without certain people in certain spaces, you know, we're not gonna always be heard. You know, I hope that there's some young politicians there in that institution at UBCO that when they leave those walls, that they go into these systems and, and the justice system, the legislative system, the healthcare, the education system. And I hope that they can carry forward and enact change alongside of us. And, you know, that was the, uh, that's the intent behind this, you know, and, you know, the intent too is to create a bit of uncomfortability, you know, because if you're not uncomfortable, chances are change isn't happening. You know, if if people are just supporting on the surface, um, the work isn't being done right. You know, you know if you're feeling uncomfortable about about things that there's something inside your body that's telling you, you know, this is wrong, this isn't right. You know, and so I hope that people feel uncomfortable, and I hope that that uncomfortability moves them to learn more, moves them to reach out and find out how can they um, stand by us? How can they be allies? How can they help? Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I just really hope that we can change the perspective of our people. You know, the, the view that we have or that, that a lot of people have towards us in Canada, um, you know, it, it's a lot of, it's, a, it's based a lot in miseducation or lack of education at times. You know, in my political role, um, I sit as a council member for chief and council. 
Okanagan Indian Band, and I've sat at a number of education tables, you know, and, and even in that realm, my intent is always to educate. Let's create awareness. Let's generate some empathy. And in turn, let's hopefully use that empathy to, to fuel, you know, some of that allyship, some of that change. So, you know, I'm, I'm grateful to have this opportunity and to, to be asked back to UBC. Um, I think this is my fourth or fifth piece that, that is part of the UBC campus. My first piece was the UBC MACE. Then the second one was the, uh, the logo for the uh, Aboriginal Services Department. Um, and then I think I created a painting as well for them. And then I, then I think we, me and Margaret worked together about four years ago for the um, Indigenous or indig Indigenizing Curriculum project that she was working on. And now this. And so, you know, these, these all go hand in hand. You know, when, when we're talking, you know, about the initiative of, of Margaret and, and the work that her and her colleagues have done, you know, alongside Jeanette and Bill to indigenize these spaces, you know, this is what I envision it being, creating space for us to, to tell our truths, to share our truths, and to just hold space for us. You know, I think that's, that's important, you know. Right now, a lot of people are asking, well, what can we do to support, you know? And I'm always, I always tell them, look, you know, the, go learn about the murdering Miss Indigenous women. Learn about what happens there. Learn about that connection to, to the genocidal attempts um, on our people. You know, in, in my opinion, a lot of these are, are very calculated, precise movements by the federal government, by the justice system to work towards the eradication or the assimilation of our people. You know, um, there, there was a quote uh, somewhere that, that speaks to um, as long as our women are still alive, you know, we'll, we'll still be here, you know. And so we really got to acknowledge that, you know, what's being done to our women is a genocidal act. And, and the lack of action by the federal government and the, the justice system um, is contributing to that genocidal act. And, you know, right now, a lot of our women are the ones that are on the front lines, you know, fighting a lot of these, these different political issues. And so, you know, they're, they're a very big target. And, and, you know, that's it. They're being targeted, you know. And it's just so tough, you know, to live with that every day that the country you live in and the system you live under and live within is, you know, doing everything they can to, to eradicate. So, you know, I think, I think that's a, a pretty good broad kind of explanation. I mean, I could, I could break this down from doctrine and discovery through Indian Act to today as to how all of these and how murder and missing women is directly linked into the, the genocidal attempts. But um, maybe we'll save that for another uh, time. I think we're getting to the point where we want to maybe open it up for some questions. Thank you very much, Sheldon. It was a, a great talk, really from the heart. Very, very. Very well said. Um, maybe before we get to the attendees, uh, maybe we can let the panelists, uh, Bill, Margaret, and myself, maybe we can have a little bit of a discussion before we open it up. Um, Bill, Margaret, any 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 comments or, or feedback uh, that that jumped out during Sheldon's talk for you? Um, well, I'll I'll jump in and say I I can promise Sheldon that uh, the painting is going to generate and incite many conversations and and um, I look forward to um, uh, creating the opportunities for our students to engage your work and um, and hopefully inviting you to come and and talk directly with our students that would be a, a wonderful opportunity for for us and for the school um, so I'm excited by the potential and um, I'm very honored that we have your work um, and I want you to know how how genuinely 
we'll invest in inciting the, the kinds of conversations you've alluded to. So thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah, I'll add a few things that uh, that were running through my was running through my mind, and also uh, that uh, came to mind when I, when I look at the painting. And uh, there's a it's it's the raised fist, and it's a raised fist in in protest, and it's uh, protesting against the violence that has occurred against against women. It's uh, occurred against the Earth Mother and what the Missing and Murder Indigenous Women's Movement, you know, they've made very clear that that uh, violence is the same violence. So, so I think that's, uh, uh, I think that's really, really important to inform any, any kind of a transformation of schooling. And it's also, uh, in terms of uh, the past continuing into the present, it's also an, an acknowledgement of those, you know, this, this this uh, painting woman that we you know we know I, I know this woman uh, she's not she didn't just arrive in this generation she's been there every generation from from time immemorial taking care of the the kids and make, <clears throat> making sure making sure there's uh, plates at tables for anyone who's hungry and making sure everyone has a auntie or a grandma who doesn't have one so so yeah I think um, so. We'll continue to develop this relationship because it's a really important one. Limit Bill. Thank you. And thoughts that, that came to mind during uh, your talk, Sheldon, for me, um, we've, we've worked together. Uh, we're working on other projects also at UBC Okanagan about a uh, beautiful daycare, but we haven't had a, a chance to, to have a coffee in a while because of COVID, we haven't had a chance to, to hang out. But when you were talking about how uh, your your family had uh, family members who were in the American Indian movement and politically active. Um, I, I, I've never had the chance to discuss with you that I had the same, that my mother was also mm. politically active uh, in the 1970s. Her mother was politically active. Her grandfather stood with uh, Louis Riel, that it's actually several generations of indigenous activists and it's something they pass on to their children. It doesn't matter how many generations it goes on. It's something we're raised with. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that, uh, that, that, that yeah it, it creates a lot of meaning and it uh, and art art is a, is a wonderful vehicle to to sort of express these ideas these these ideas that we're raised with um, so uh, I, I sort of I sort of saw a, a similar background and, and maybe that's that's what what helps uh, <laughs> um, yeah sort of amplify these voices is that they come from from many generations yeah by all means it, it, it was something I was raised around. Um, I don't know, I just grew up thinking it was normal to to be in those spaces and, and growing up and now becoming a, a political leader for our nation, you know. Um, I see that not all of our people were raised in, in that way. And, and so, you know, I think coming in and sharing these sorts of things and, and even educating our own young ones you know, there, there is a gap there, even with some of our own youth, that they're not fully uh, aware of, of some of our, our history. So, you know, I, I also use that platform to, to inform and help um, educate our own as well, too. Well, thank you. I see we have our, our first question um, from the attendants. Uh, it's from Alana Vernon. Uh, she says, I'm always impressed with the details and symbolism in your paintings and carvings. Can you tell me more about those elements in this painting? Yeah, hi, Elena. Um, you know, it's good to, to connect with you again. Alana was actually um, uh, instrumental in, in getting me into uh, UBC when I carved the uh, ceremonial mace that, that's carried during convocation. Her and, and uh, Bernie Marchand, uh, were quite uh, relentless. Um, I turned them down three times. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that they called me back the last time when I, they, they convinced me to uh, come and do this work at UBC. Um, you know, I think some of the symbolism when we look at, um, you know, I think I alluded to the, uh, the mask and, and the red dress. And um, when we look at this, this painting as well, um, you'll notice and, and um, it's adorned with elk teeth. 
and the intent around that is um, for, for our people, as well as other different indigenous groups, elk teeth were, uh, um, I guess, a symbol of wealth. Um, elk have, have two um, ivory teeth. And, and so in, in order to um, adorn an entire dress for, for your wife, uh, took quite a, a, a commitment and a lot of, a lot of work, you know, and, and so th those elk teeth are really a sign of worth and a, and a sign of how much um, our women are worth. And, and um, a couple of years ago, we actually did a, uh, an exhibit for, for Vernon Public Art Gallery um, around murdered and missing Indigenous women. I curated one there and I, I created an image at that time um, of another woman in a, in a red elk tooth dress. And so I used that same imagery here um, again to, to symbolize just how, oh, how much our women are worth to us. You know, and it shows, you know, in, in that dress that, that we value them and, and, and you know, um, some of the imagery in the background kind of, uh, I guess, kind of alludes to, you know, uh, a, a bit of a brighter future. Um, and coincidentally, the, uh, the, the overall, I guess, um, structure or what you, whatever you call it of the image was, um, I took inspiration from an old Buffy St. Marie, uh, I think it was an album cover. Um, and so, you know, I, I've, I've pulled from a number of different areas for this one. Um, and it's usually what my typical process is, is I, some stuff I, I, I put it just under the surface, you know, some of that symbolism and I don't always um, explain it. Sometimes, like I said, I'll leave some of that there until people come in and they ask, well, what does this mean? Well, I'm glad you asked that. This is what that means. You know, you, you, you want to create and, and leave some curiosity there so people can create that engagement on their own. Um, and again, around her wrist, you'll, you'll notice she has some traditional tattoo markings. Um, I just recently have... Uh, gone through uh, a training under my mentor, uh, Dion Kazaz, who was also a, a UBC uh, graduate, um, did his thesis on traditional hand poke tattoo as an Inklahatan um, artist. Um, he trained me to um, revive the uh, traditional silk tattooing um, within our nation. And so um, because I couldn't tattoo during COVID, I, I thought, you know, I, I got to put some of this uh, revival tattoo revival work into this and again come in and show those those markings usually those markings were were related to coming of age or to uh, visions and so um again there um i'll kind of leave the, the meaning behind that tattoo on her arm uh, for another time but but there is some meaning behind some of the marks that i made there uh, Sheldon, I'll jump in because somebody asked a question exactly about that. Chris Gennard asked, what is the symbolism behind the marking on the woman's wrist in your painting? Okay. Well, um, maybe you could put that uh, back up on the screen for a second. So what we, what we see um, low down on her wrist, closest to her hand, is a, um, an earth line. Um, and, and those marks that are coming down, um, those represent that connection to the earth. Um, you know, I was taught from, from my partner, Chisekwa, about the fringe on our buckskin um, outfits, um, which similarly kind of translates into the uh, ribbon skirt and the ribbons reaching down to the earth. It, it's intended to show our um, humbleness and our, our connection to the earth. Um, the next line we go up, it, it shows uh, it's a waterway, a river, or a creek. And again, it, 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 for me, it's signified that, you know, being a water protector, fighting for Mother Earth, um, but also showing that strength and that power in water. And the next mark above that are uh, mountains. Again, showing that, that connection to um, kind of that, 
ceremonial spiritual type space i guess um i've recently over the last few years of um committed to fasting and and being doing that work for the rest of my life and, and so being up on that mountain and and um doing that type of work is what those those uh mountains mean and then the, the next line is the sky and then the other circular um, imagery represents the, uh, the cycles of the moon thank you uh, for the question chris and thank you for the explanation sheldon our next question is from jody nelson you have created such a multi-layered piece of art it makes me wonder if you have specific parts that provoke you specific parts of of this i mean you know everything everything provokes me about my art you know i i'm i'm usually quite um deliberate with everything that i put in there um but you know i, I think you know bill alluded to it you know that that fist in the air you know that show of strength and that show of resistance resilience you know that that fight that's in us you know it, it really it, it brings me back you know to those those days when I was a, a very angry young teenage man and, and I was filled with anger and angst you know it it brings that back a little for me you know and being able to show it here in this imagery given the position that I have as a, a political leader um, I've had to learn and, and watch those around me and, and learn about tactfulness and, and being very mindful of how I use my voice. So there's some times where these emotions and these feelings, that, that teenage boy, they come to the surface. And a lot of times I can't say what I want to say um, because I, I got to be mindful of, of my role and, and that responsibility that I carry. And so sometimes when I'm not able to, I guess, verbally um, get those sorts of things out, it, it, it tends to find its way into my art. Um, it's a bit of a release mechanism for me to, to just get that energy out. Because if I don't get that energy out, it, it starts to pour over into my work, into my family. And so, so yeah. Um, uh, and follow-up question from Jody Nelson. Sheldon, I wish to say Lim, Lim Lip for sharing with us this beautiful piece of art and for taking this time to speak your wisdom and the wisdom of your people with us. Uh, you have said that the artist has a responsibility to use her platform to create space to, for engaged dialogue. Do you foresee a space where young non-Indigenous allies might come together with young Indigenous artists to spend time together? Yeah, I mean, by all means, you know, I think the young people of today, they're living in a much different space uh, than from when I was a young person. And I imagine, you know, a, a much different space from, from when Bill was a, a, a young man. You know, um, I grew up in a time where uh, racism was quite rampant um, in the area. And we were, we didn't mix very much with with the non-indigenous we kept very much to ourselves but today you know a lot of those barriers are are starting to dissolve you know those oh those thoughts and those feelings towards indigenous people i think are starting to shift now with these newer generations people are starting to see us more as humans than i think for the color of our skin you know in these younger generations so you know, I'm already seeing some of those shifts where where different cultural um, groups and backgrounds are are starting to come together. You know, and and by all means, I I hope at one point some of these young artists that I've helped mentor um, will be part of those creating those spaces. Thank you. And uh, just a note: uh, there's there were two Jody Delsons who asked two different questions. 
and one of the Jody Nelsons said, I didn't ask that question, but yes, I, I do think there's two different Jody Nelsons here today. Uh, the next question is from Maggie Shirley. There's only one Maggie Shirley. Uh, Way Sheldon, I want to contradict the idea that your early work wasn't political. Your show in the Kootenai Gallery made a political statement. That's part of what I love about your work. I have a question about the sun in the painting. What is the symbolism behind it? Uh, hi, Maggie. Uh, I wish I could get over there into the Kootenai areas this year, maybe next year after COVID. You know, Maggie had uh, curated a show for me and my partner uh, called Determination, where we spoke to the uh, environmental impacts of the, uh, the dams on the Columbia River system. Um, but I think, you know, those, those ones were definitely political, but I think about seven years ago, Maggie, I was still playing a, a little bit safe with my imagery and being a little bit more covert with some of the messaging. Um, but the, the, the image of the sun, um, you know, I, I, again, I, I, I took some of this inspiration from uh, um, an album cover of Buffy St. Marie. I think somebody had kind of reworked it a bit, remixed it, but um it was an image of, of Buffy standing there. She didn't have her fist in the air, but uh, she was standing there with this nice, big, bright, you know, sunny background behind her. And, you know, this was the the seventies, you know, and that feel of that, that flower power and, 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 you know, what, what the, those sorts of things evoked, you know, I, I wanted to kind of, I don't know, capture, I guess, some of what that old movement was from back then you know, today it's, it's framed a lot much more around, um, unfortunately, violence and, and you know, um, militarized type um, movements, you know, but this one, I, I wanted to just capture that um, there's much more to it than that, you know, there, there is a lot more um, love, I think, behind the, the, the movements that we, that we, um, bring forward. Um, but a lot of times it's just not captured and seen. So I, I just really wanted to capture that there and, and show that, you know what, no matter how dark um, of a place that our people can be in it sometimes, you know, there, there always is some of that um, brightness and some of that uh, sunshine there. Thank you for the, the question and the, the answer. Sheldon, uh, just to jump in about the the sunshine when you were speaking about indigenous women uh, being targeted or being targets uh, right away I thought that this looked like a bullseye thing sort of behind her her head as well it was uh, maybe yeah. un unintentional but I just saw it I, I had the same thoughts you know and, and I also it does kind of almost uh, it almost invokes a little bit of uh, almost biblical type imagery as well too and I was like ooh I don't know if I want to add oh, that halo. There, you sort of like a halo thing right? yeah I definitely didn't mean that but after <laughs> I started painting it I, I I couldn't help but see it in that way but um you know even in that sense you know it, it does show you know these people you know because in that type of biblical imagery you know they, they used to use that that light, that kind of halo imagery to show, you know, the, the importance and the divineness of a person. So I, I think it, it works. It, it wasn't, you know, the intent here, but I think if we were to look at it in that, that light and, and reference it in that way, you know, it would also kind of show this, this woman in that type of light as well too. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, if there's, any other questions um, from the attendees or if the panelists would like to say anything uh, before we, we, uh, we sum it up for today? Um, uh, Margaret or Bill, and any last questions or comments from other panelists? Just limit. You have a lot of thank yous here. You have a lot of limits. Uh, Maritza Lewis has a question for you. Where would you like to see your work go in the future? Mm, Maritza, she's a fellow artist and uh, cousin of mine. She's doing some pretty awesome work out there in the world. You know, I future, you know, I don't know, really, you know, um, 
I don't really think too far ahead. You know, right now my my thoughts are just getting uh, the work on my plate done that I have. But you know, I think you know my my intent is to to create a piece of artwork that can be in in any type of um, institution. You know, something that's gonna continuously generate conversation. You know, I know that with UBC, um, the works that I've done there are going to outlive me. The, the conversations that those, those pieces um, generate are, are going to go on long after I'm, I'm not here, you know. And, you know, that, I think that's, I've never really shared this, but that's the intent, I think, you know, one of the other intents behind my work, um, Maritza and I's great grandfather, Pierre Lewis, um, who's chief of our community. Um, the Vernon Museum had a, a bust sculpted of him and, and it sits there still today. And I can remember going in that museum and being like, you know, great grandpa is going to be remembered forever because of this. And I always was like, man, I, I want that. You know, I want people to, to remember me. I want my great grandkids to walk into some place and, and be like, hey, that, that's my grandfather's painting. And, you know, so I think, you know, for me, I mean, I, I obviously want to flood the Okanagan with my art. Um, you know, my, my cousin uh, jokes a lot of times. And before I say this, no, no offense to any of the artists out there, but uh, he makes the comment sometimes that we have a lot of uh, winery art in the, uh, in the valley, a lot of uh, typical Okanagan rolling hills and scenery. And, you know, it's beautiful art, but, you know, I want to see more content in art. I want to see art that invokes things that that pushes boundaries. So, you know, I want to see my art in, in as many places within our territory that I can can be, you know, because end of the day, I want to inspire other young artists that are out there in our territory. I want to inspire other young leaders in our territory. You know, when we created uh, our arts collective, the intent was we we're underrepresented in our own territory. We, we see so much other indigenous art in our territory, but there was, you know, aside from Barb and Ron Hall and um, Noel Derrickson, you know, it, there, there really wasn't a heavy presence of Okanagan art. And so those of us who are out there doing artwork now, there, there's a number of us out here in the Okanagan from the nation that are um, doing amazing work. And I think our intent is always to just showcase to the world like hey you know we're here it's a very important message and uh and yeah i think the the wonderful thing about this this painting that's now in ubc okanagan uh university's art collection is we loan it out if uh, another gallery anywhere in the world wants to borrow it we can we can send this painting and, and they can it can it can travel well beyond the boundaries of this particular region it can become an international moving piece and definitely in the future when we do curate shows in different galleries uh, around BC or around Canada this piece will go on tour it will leave uh, the, its current home in the uh, education uh, engineering building and uh, it, it, it will it will meet new people it will spark new interests it'll start new conversations and it will do what it was intended to do Thank, thanks to Sheldon Margaret mm. for commissioning it um, Bill for, for being here today and, uh, and all everyone who attended for, for making this uh, a wonderful event, a wonderful evening. Um, when you get a chance to come to campus to see Sheldon's work, uh, please do. And, and as Margaret said, we're hoping to do some programming around this. Uh, I know Sheldon's very busy right now. He's uh, very much in demand and many different projects, but uh, in the future, it would be wonderful to do some workshops or public programming when we can, we can meet together again in person. So that's, mm -hmm. that's something else we would, we would like to do. Uh, also for the, the daycare mural that Sheldon's going to do uh, at the university. That's, that's uh, his next project uh, that we're working on together and, and some programming around that as well. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to everybody who, who came and, and attended this. You know, I, I hope that uh, you guys can all take something back and, and start those conversations. You know, I, I, I rely on that. Well, I, I can only do so much as an artist. Uh, the real work is done after people see the art and, and they start to have those conversations. 
Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for, for everyone who attended this talk and helped organize and be here tonight. Um, I, I guess we'll, we'll call it a night then. Everyone take care in this, in this hot, hot heat and we'll see you around. Goodbye. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Sheldon. Thank you. Thanks, Stacy. And thanks, thanks Paul.